In 1982, the same year that Night Stalker released, Mattel Electronics held a competition internally to see who could come up with the best Intellivision game concept on a magic theme. Now, Fantasy was already in their wheelhouse, having developed products for the Dungeons & Dragons brand. The winner of the competition was Connie Goldman, a member of the team who was capable of producing lovely images with the limited hardware. She began work on her design, initially called Magic Castle, and later Mystic Castle, but the project saw many delays as Connie was frequently needed elsewhere in the company. Her animations were in high demand, and she was often pulled off to work on other projects. Even seeing some of the work that she produced for Mystic Castle itself siphoned off to other people's projects. Eventually, though, her project did see some attention. David Warhol, who she'd worked with on Mindstrike previously, came on board to help with programming, design refinements, and music. Unfortunately, by the time the project, now called Thundercastle, had been completed or near it, the video game industry in the United States was not in a healthy place. It had suffered a major collapse, and Mattel wanted out of it. They sold the Intellivision brand to a former employee who would found INTV Corporation, and slowly try to get the system back onto its feet. It would be 1986 by the time Thunder Castle finally hit the market. And at that point, it was a pretty insignificant flash in the eyes of the public. But even distant flashes, given time, can roll over the Thunder Castle is regarded as one of the most beautiful games on the Intellivision by retro enthusiasts these days. I'd like to give its design at least as much attention, though. In Thunder Castle, the knight you control seeks out magic creatures that empower it to slay the evil guardians that stalk it on each screen. Each guardian starts green is replaced by a yellow version when slain, and when that yellow version is slain, is replaced by a final red form. Initially, the green version is markedly slower than the knight. The yellow version is almost as swift, and the red version substantially faster. Thunder Castle is a game in three acts. A three-act cycle, actually. You start in a forest, thick and twisting. A dragon stalks the woods, and two bats begin to flutter about the screen. The dragon is your adversary, the evil guardian of the grounds around the castle. The bats are the magic creatures that can empower you, however briefly, to defeat it if you're able to touch them. This green dragon's slow pace means it's normally not a great threat, but the maze of thickets and trees shifts as brambles open and close, cutting off pathways or opening up new ones. If you get caught in a dead end, that might be your night's end. Each act has pieces of terrain known as gates that shift in and out of existence to change the layout. This act has the most, though, with six variable tiles. The second act, which you reach once the red dragon is slain, has only five gates, but sees you pursued by two sorcerers at once through a castle, 
seeking a mouse that scurries through the halls as the magic creature to energize you and enable your victories. Having to contend with more than one pursuer means you're now at risk of being cut off, which creates a much dicier situation for you. Even more perilous is the stage past the six total sorcerers, a deadly dungeon patrolled by a trio of demons at a time. Down here, in this final act, you seek flashing red skulls that teleport from place to place as your means to thwart the imps. If you are a sufficiently stalwart knight to finish this third act, you're set back to the forest to begin the cycle anew. Each time you restart the cycle, though, the evil guardians are faster. Your energized state does not last as long, and there are other wrinkles to contend with. It becomes easy to feel overwhelmed, but you do have a set of boons to employ that I've neglected to mention so far. Magic objects appear at random and possess incredibly useful properties. You can hold only one at a time, and you can use it only once with the press of a button before its power is discharged. The Grail is the most straightforwardly useful. When you call on its power, it fills you with the same energy that the magic creatures do, putting you in a position to turn the tables on your pursuers. The crown halts the movement of the guardians, and the magic creature, if it's a mouse, for a moment, and renders the guardians harmless while they're frozen, thus enabling a safe escape or a devastating offense. The necklace speeds your knight up, which is especially useful as foes become quicker. The lantern extends the duration of the energized state. The ring warps you to a random spot in the maze, and the key, which I find especially interesting, allows you to phase through or hide in a wall or gate. All of these items add a layer of planning and strategy that takes Thundercastle beyond what many of its contemporaries were doing. Collecting any of these deployable items earns you points. There are, I should mention, also three items that are collected for the express purpose of changing numbers. These are not held in reserve for later use. There are candlesticks, which provide extra lives, coins worth 500 points, and combs, which actually cut your score in half. Usually items appearing on paths provide strong incentive to route towards them. Combs, providing a reason not to take a corridor, complicate decision-making in interesting ways. The comb, funnily enough, was selected as a symbol of vanity. A sin, of course. So we can see that Thunder Castle playfully references and employs Christian iconography and values. It might be interesting, then, to examine the game through the lens of the four cardinal virtues. Those being justice, prudence, temperance, and fortitude. Justice, the quality of being just, fair, or impartial. Even-handedness, the rendering of what is due or merited. From the outset, the Guardians pursue you, with no provocation. Turnabout is fair play, though, and your task is to serve them their just desserts. Prudence, the exercise of thoughtful care, sound judgment or discretion, cautious wisdom. You're confronted with a choice at every intersecting corridor, and these choices need to be well-reasoned. 
If you take the wrong path, it is easy to get in over your head in Thunder Castle. Not every corridor is created equal in terms of risk. The game features three possible layouts for each act, and each has their own array of passageways to assess and adapt to. The longer a corridor is, the further you have to go before you can readjust your strategy, and the more likely it may be that you'll find yourself penned in by pursuers if there are more than one. Here's a visualization of which paths have the largest gaps between intersections. The deeper the blue, the longer the gap. The placement of gates is a consideration that complicates things further. They can either help or hinder you as you evade or pursue, and it's down to how aware you are of their timing and how judiciously you move around them. Accounting for so many variables requires significant prudence, I think. Temperance, habitual moderation and self-control, especially in the indulgence of any appetite. The magical objects that appear at random in play can be key to doing well in Thunder Castle. That said, they can also tempt a player into a dangerous situation. If you don't exercise restraint, these treasures may as well be death traps, particularly as the speed of their appearance and disappearance increases. During later rounds of play, they often spawn too far away for your knight to actually reach them in time. You need to set limits for yourself, and temper your expectations. Fortitude, patient and constant courage to endure pain, adversity, or peril. Many complain that Thunder Castle generates stalemates, and that much of its playtime is spent in tension between forces orbiting each other in the maze. That's not untrue. There's a lot of biding time, waiting for openings to act on. It takes a fair bit of focus to avoid doing something stupid while you're hunting for that opportunity, though. It's a test. The test gets more harrowing as you play through later screens. As the duration of your energized states dwindles towards something vanishingly brief, you need to ensure you're closer and closer to the Guardian by the time you obtain that state. Especially given how fast the Guardians get eventually, this leaves you dancing on a knife's edge as you try to find success in the late game and doing so while attempting to maintain the aforementioned prudence and temperance. The variables in Thunder Castle make it feel much more lively than its contemporaries do to me. In Pac-Man, the power pellets that let you repel or eat your pursuers are always in the same spots on the map. Thunder Castle's equivalents in the magic creatures roam and meander in distinct ways from act to act. Bats flit about the map from spot to spot, but directly and linearly in their paths, which facilitates interception. The mouse, with its anxious, stilted skittering, responds to your own position on the screen. The red skulls blink in and out of existence sporadically throughout their dungeon. Oh, and those bats? I should say get even more interesting as the game progresses. In the fourth round, there are two black ones, only visible when passing over trees. In the seventh round, green, and seen again, but only one. In the tenth round, which I have trouble reaching, personally, um, as well as all further rounds that take place in the forest, there is only one black bat. The randomness of Thunder Castle adds a lot of engagement, but it might actually be one of the reasons it's not broadly known. 
where something like Pac-Man has always had a large following of high score chasers, a game with as much randomness as Thunder Castle may not feel fair enough to provide an even playing field for competitive gamers. It's easy for a player to attribute their success or failure to what items dropped, where, and when, or which layouts they had to contend with. It's funny, given how many games deliberately strive to provide randomly generated or procedural elements these days. The replayability it lends is part of what keeps people coming back to many games, knowing that the events will play out differently next time. If we're looking for elements that stunt competitiveness, I should probably note that when gauging relative success in Thundercastle, score alone is functionally meaningless. One can linger in safe situations with a single opponent and simply wait for items to drop in reachable places. Given that speed only increases based on what round of play you're in, you can farm points this way indefinitely, particularly if you find a safe loop to wait at for favorable conditions. So long as your opponent is singular and of equal or lesser speed, any structure with no variables around its perimeter can be circled without fear. If we're to instead gauge success by how quickly one can ascend through the rounds, or perhaps a combination of that and score, maybe competition can seem more meaningful. Still, the scoring system on its own kind of muddies the waters. For someone like me, who's playing it for pure personal enjoyment, those kind of issues aren't particularly meaningful, though. There is so much to appreciate in Thundercastle, from its evocative title screens with cleverly incorporated credits, to the impressively rendered music in the background. David Warhol incorporated sections of classical music Compared to something like Night Stalker, the sights and sounds of Thunder Castle are remarkably rich. And the joy of navigating those 12 by 20 mazes a little bit more wisely each time you play sticks with you. <laughs>